At this time, we're going to go into our message for today. Our scripture text is coming from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. If everyone has to say amen. If you don't, say hold on. Amen. The scripture text in Ephesians 4 and 11, 16 reads like this. It says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the men of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. For whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to talk about the scripture. The um, title of our message today is the nine marks. Of a healthy church. And I lately, um, I haven't really been struggling with what I was going, what I'll be preaching about. But I've I've been very careful because I, I see that God has us in a place. And whether people have a negative idea or a positive idea about the wilderness, we need to know that the wilderness is all not always a bad place to be. Um, The wilderness is an opportunity for you to be in a place where you only can hear and depend on God. It's an opportunity for you to say, no matter what I think about a situation, I need to rethink it based on how God thinks. It's it's for me to be in a place where I'm 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 kind of set in a place where I have to to be settled and 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 not feel like I have all the comforts that I, I think I should have. The wilderness is not a bad place. It's a place where I can only trust and depend on God. It's a place where I have to recognize before I go into another place, a better place, that I have to first prepare myself. And I feel like God has us in that place. I feel like he's been talking to us and teaching us um, um, something that we need to know in preparation for something greater. Um, I believe the messages that he's been giving me has been speaking to us. And in and, and, and certain settings, it may seem discouraging to talk about spiritual immaturity. But I feel like it was encouraging to be able to say to people in the room that I see your growth. I see that you, you take the word, you hear the word, you live by the word. And even though these chairs aren't filled, it doesn't mean that the church is not healthy. Does not mean that we look at these chairs and it, it is a direct um, reflection on the growth of the individuals in the church, which God is only interested in. God is not interested in full chairs that um, very honestly pastors, preachers and, uh, and leadership and church and administrators only care about the chairs being full filled because that means we can buy a bigger church or we can make sure the lights get paid. But if, if you you trust in God for what he called you to do, then you don't look at the chairs. You look at God. You don't look at what people are doing and saying and what people are suggesting and and the direction they're trying to push you in. You keep going back to God because it's him who had called you. And so when you look at a church, you don't look at what we think. And that's the problem. The church has come so far based on what people thought the church should look like. And I talked about that um, previously because it's important we don't get caught up in that idea. Because we have a church idea and we have to be honest about that. We go into the church and people have admittedly come into this room. And they say because it don't look like the church that I'm used to. 
It don't look like the church I'm used to seeing or the church I'm used to going or the church I'm looking for. It doesn't have the choir. It doesn't have um, the children's group and men's ministry and all these things going on. It ain't church. And we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in those things because we have to make sure that a church is healthy. Because even after we do all those things, then people still won't be growing. People still won't be loving God. People still won't be loving each other. And we'll have everything going on with no love. We'll have everything going on without the spirit of God being present in this place. We'll have everything going on with the the message and the word of God not being preached. But people walking out with an emotion and a feeling, but not growing not one bit. Not knowing what God is really trying to say to them that they can really apply to their lives that is going to make a difference. Healthy churches allow people to do that. Unhealthy churches give people that feeling, give them exactly what they think they want, and then they still don't have what they really need. It's like fast food. It's like junk food. We eat chips and candy, hamburgers and hot dogs, and we want to go through the drive through and get it. But we know that's not what our body really needs. We look at it, it's appealing. Yeah, I want that double cheeseburger with the lettuce, tomatoes, and all that stuff, and I'm excited about it, but when I'm done with it, I'm feeling bad. I'm drugged down, I'm tired, and I know it was no good for me, but I wanted it. But it, it's not what is healthy, and it's not what's going to make me healthy. And so we have to get to the point, as mature Christians, as, as little kids and babes in Christ, of course we're going to come into the church, and it's going to be what I want. But as you grow and recognize that this thing is not about me, that when God called me to himself, he called me saying, you have to give up everything. It's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you your rights, your liberty. And what you thought was was fair to you, God say, I'm going to make it unfair. I'm going to flip flop it. That even when people talk about you, you still got to pray a pray for them. Even though they mistreat you, you still got to love them. If they slap you on one cheek, you need to turn the other one. I'm going to make it where you're uncomfortable in this thing because it's not about you. And so when we come into the church, we don't come looking for what we can get. Maybe in the beginning, but when we've come so far, it should become a point where we're looking for God. What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me at? Where's my spot, my position? I don't want to be doing what she's doing. I want to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Healthy churches kind of cultivates that thing. And so when it's time to build a children's ministry, it's not built out of something people said we should do. It's built out of us knowing it's something we should do. And it's done with the right motivation, the right commitment, the right attitude, and it doesn't just start up and die. Because somebody thought it was a good idea, and the person that thought it was a good idea moved to another church with another idea. The idea person. Let me go to this church and see if I can get a meeting with the pastor and tell him, I think. You should have this, and you should have that. And then as soon as it's up and running, they gone. To the next. With a bunch of other good ideas. Not God ideas. And they, they're not there to commit to it and make sure it's up and running for the long run. Because they didn't come to a spiritual healthy church that says, what's your motivation hold up? You need to slow it down. Where's your heart at? Are you ready to commit and serve to what you're talking about? And if you ask them that before you hear the idea, they'll be like, no, I'm going to go to another church. Because somebody's going to hear me. Somebody's going to want to say, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do it. And and you have to be careful because you want to give people liberty. You don't want people to come and say, well, they don't let nothing happen at this church. Well, I'm not going to let nothing happen that starts one week and is dead the next. Because it, it, it shows inconsistency. It makes God look like he's crazy. Like he's inconsistent, like he's not doing what he says he's going to do. Why would he call people to to start up a ministry that's going to last three months? That's not the God we serve. In a healthy church, a, a ministry that begins will never die. That's why it's important you cultivate that thing based on these nine principles. And these aren't the only principles about what you should be looking for in a church. And, and you go in there, oh, the singing good, I'm joining Oh, the pastor show can preach. He's sweating. I'm joining. The mother show come and hug me when I come in. I'm joining. They only pass the plate around one time. I'm joining. 
Those aren't the marks. Those aren't the things that God says, this is a church that you should never leave. But we sit in churches that are sick in spirit and very wealthy and, and, and very prosperous in the things that God say really don't matter. Those are, those are the works that I will judge and be burnt up in the fire and then I'll look for what's left and you'll have nothing. You'll have no spiritual, um, no spiritual depth, no spiritual substance when God gets through with it. Let me burn off the men's ministry. What's left? Let me burn off the youth group that just go on field trips. Burn that up. And then what do you have? You have no spiritual depth in the church. So it's important that we build the church on the right principles and ideas. And as members of the church, we are willing to accept it when it's not making me feel good. When it's not about me, when it doesn't put me up front, doesn't let me talk, doesn't let me put my ideas in play. And I'm okay with that. That I look and say, long as I could come to a church and I know it's the church that God called it to be, that's the church I want to be part of because I know I will grow and I will be I'll be connected to God and I will be the person God called me to be and the church will be the one that nurtures that. The scripture text tells us that. That's why God put these people in place so that he can equip you to be better so the church can be better, the body can be better, we all can move forward. This is what God is trying to accomplish. In the church. Amen? Amen. So we're looking today at the first mark. But I want to tell you that. In the weeks prior, I did imply that New Manor is a healthy church. And like I said, you can look next to you or in chairs on the other side and say. Why would you call this a church that's healthy and we don't have everything we need? But when I look at what God says a church should have, we have it. Because that's what I'm making sure that I'm not checking off the boxes that all the books of people who say they start churches, grow churches, got churches that's 15,000 deep. Because people are saying in a church of 600, I only got 60 people that's really committed. I want 600 committed if I got 600 joining. You can't have that if the church is not spiritually healthy. So as a pastor and a leader, I'm checking off these boxes while other people are checking off some other boxes. What makes me comfortable? What makes me feel good? What is the pastor saying stuff that don't make me uncomfortable? Those are the boxes they checking off. When I want to get a meeting with the pastor, can I meet with him? Those are the things people check off, but God has got a whole set of different criteria that a lot of people don't consider. And I want to introduce you to those so when you get discouraged, that things aren't looking like people say. Because the first thing people are going to ask you is what church you go to. Who's the pastor? Because if he ain't somebody famous or somebody they heard about, then they already didn't cut you off in their mind. And you just talking to yourself at that point. And then they ask you, how many members is at that church? Now, if you are a member of New Manor Community Church and you begin to mumble, there's a problem. It's because you don't understand that it's not the number. God is not looking at the number. It's how much that number can accomplish in the spirit of God. Because you can have a thousand people doing nothing for God. And you can have five doing everything if they're doing it with the right attitude and the right spirit. So people are going to ask you those things, and if you are uncomfortable with the answer, you have to examine yourself. Say, oh, we got about 10 people? Maybe like 10. How long? Then the next question is, how long have y'all been a church, a ministry? And you'll tell them about six years. But just think about this. You have to think about spiritually and naturally, and, and we have to kind of put this idea out there so the people who are natural can understand that if a child is six years old, how much do you really expect for them to be Amen. in six years? Amen. You can't expect a whole lot. And, and we'll say, OK, but I see churches start the first year, got 500 members. But we have to understand that there is growth in a church that is called cyclical, that we're just sharing members, that these 10 go to the next church and then to the next church. And we're just sharing members. And they just moving around. I don't want 500 shifting members. 
I want 500 that's going to sit here and stay or sit here and go on missions or in overseas countries and going into these communities and making a difference. I don't want 500 that's going to go somewhere else to do the same thing they was doing here. That's not what God is calling us to. We want people that are prepared to make a change because God is preparing you in the church for that, to make a difference, to be the church, to edify each other and the world. Amen. Amen. So the nine marks ask, how can you tell if a church is healthy or even more? How can you tell if your church is healthy? The author of the book that I read says, excuse me, it makes the assertion that a spiritually healthy church will experience spiritual growth and even membership growth. And I'm not so much interested in the membership growth, but you need to know that the, the spiritual growth will turn into membership growth. That I'm not worried that if I got a church that where the people are going spiritually, that the church won't ever grow because I know when people come, they'll stay. Because the people here are mature. They know how to talk to people. They know how to love people. They know how to do things according to how God said. And they know how to challenge people. And when people leave, they're not ready. Don't, don't, if, if I know you spiritually mature and people leave, I'm not worried. Because they weren't ready for what they was coming into. And I'm not worried. What I'm worried about is, is when people are spiritually mature and you bring people into this church and you running them away because you just like them. That's not what I want. So, and neither is that what God wants. The author says the nine attributes, attributes are marks that may set a church apart, that may distinguish a sound, healthy church, a biblical church, from many or more of its sickly sisters. That these marks will t- be able to have you go into a church and be able to tell the difference between a church that is sickly and a church that is healthy. And, and, I, and I try to encourage people because you never know where people or God is going to send people. So I'm not going to look at and talk to everybody like I know you're going to be here forever. But if you go somewhere else, I want you to be able to go into a church and identify this church is sick. And know that you can't do anything as a member for a sick church but pray for it. That it is God has to impose upon the pastor and the leaders to say we have to be doing the things that God says makes this church healthy before we can move forward with anything. And we can't, we, have, we can't jump from church to church every time we see a church sick. We need to know when a church is healthy, get there and stay there. Stay there. So the nine marks of a healthy church are exposition, expo, um, expositional preaching. And I'll talk about that because that's going to be what we talk about today. Uh, biblical theology, a biblical understanding of the good news, biblical understanding of conversion, a biblical understanding of evangelism, biblical understanding of church membership, biblical church discipline, a concern from promoting Christian discipleship and growth and biblical church leadership. And so, like I said, today we'll talk about the importance of expositional preaching. In Ephesians 4 and 11 and 12, the scripture we read today says that and he gave him, he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The definition of expositional preaching is preaching whose object is to expound on what is said in a particular passage of scripture, carefully explaining its meaning and applying it to the congregation. Now, if you've been to churches before, you know that everybody doesn't preach in this style. And it's not that you should always be preaching in this style because you can preach in a topical way. You can say that I'm going to preach on a topic based on everything the Bible says about this one particular thing. If I'm going to preach about prayer, I'm going to preach about tithing and offering, I can do that. That's fine. But that shouldn't be my primary style of preaching. I can also preach on subjects or biographies. I can preach on Moses. I can preach on Jesus. I can just do biographical types of preaching, and that's okay. But the majority of preaching should be done in an expositional style because what it does is it takes the scripture text as it is in context. And it takes that scripture text and it doesn't just let you read it 
and read it as it is and leave you there. But expositional preaching says I take the scripture text and then I blow it up. Let you see it for what God is trying to say to it. Because what the, what the author says is that if a, if a pastor takes a scripture text and just reads it and doesn't expound on it, then he only understands it as much as he did before anyway. And then the, the membership only understands it as much as they did before. But when you do expositional preaching, you are challenging yourself to seek God for an understanding of what was his point. What was it, what was the message trying? What was that scripture trying to tell you? And then you have to try to get people to after you blow it up, then lay it on their lives, then take it and put it on top of their lives and apply it and move forward. But if I just give you the scripture and I let you read it and you go read that before. And I have the same understanding, the, 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 the challenge or the responsibility of the pastor is to take that scripture text, open it up, give you a revelation of it, and give it to you in a way that you can then take it and use it for your life. Ex- expositional preaching is the best style of preaching because it just doesn't leave me where I am. It is mobile. It moves me forward in the word of God. It allows me to grow because I know more today than I did yesterday. We need that style of preaching to be going forward. We don't need people to take one scripture verse and then preach on it for two hours and people are still the same. We need people to take scripture text line by line and then tell people what God is trying to say to them for their life. So change can happen. Constant, effective spiritual change can happen because this is what God intended to be done with his word. He wanted us to understand it so we can use it for our lives. The def- um, in Nehemiah 8 and 7 through 8, you don't have to go there, but write the scripture text down. It's interesting because it says also, Yeshua, Bani, Sharia, Baya, Jamin, Akub, Shabithia, Hadijah, Masia, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah and the Levites helped the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them understand the reading. So this gives us an example how even in the Old Testament that when they read to them the law, they just didn't say, oh, that's just what God said. Now go try to do it because you, you mess people up like that. People go to church and they hear stuff in these big words and these, these big ideas coming from the Bible. And you expect me as the lay member to take it, digest it and do something with it. it you ain't explained nothing to me. You might have made me feel good today, but I, can, I ain't got nothing I can use for my life. Nothing I can go into the next week and apply it and the next week and apply it. That, that my life is better tomorrow than it was today. We need that style of preaching so that people can hear it and understand it and say, oh, that's what God meant. Now let me go do it. Because if I don't understand it, what am I going to do? It's like when I read a regular book and I don't know what the word means and I try to assume a guess. And if I just assume wrong, then I, what I understand will be wrong. So it's important you have someone preaching and teaching you in a way to make sure you understand what God is saying. So now you can apply it effectively so you can be hearers and doers. Amen. Amen. So an expositional preacher uses a preaching style that helps people understand scripture more than they did before. It's not just explanation. It's application. Explanation and application. Dwyer, the the author, says that the preacher who only preaches on a certain topic and teaches it in context, they will always only preach what they already know. And in turn, the congregation will only know what they already knew about the scripture. Amen. Expositional preaching seeks to make the point of the scripture like magnification that is then laid on top of your life in application. Making it bigger, making the ideas bigger. Because sometimes you read the Bible like a book and you have no idea. You're like, oh, this is a story. Let me read through it. But you need somebody to stop you and have you look at it and magnify it and say, how does this fit what I have going on? Because people try to accuse the Bible of not being relevant. 
of not saying the Bible does the 2,000 year old document has nothing to do with what I got going on right now. Then if you believe that, you can stop right now because God is relevant. God is all knowing. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. He knew what your life was going to be before it started. He tells Jeremiah, I knew you before you was even in your mother's womb. I know what you're going to go through. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to this earth and he was tested at every point. He knows the type of afflictions we go through. So God, don't don't try to play God like you don't understand my pain. Because God created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He has counted and numbered every hair on your head. So when people try to say the God of the Bible doesn't understand me, then you're fooling yourself. So you need somebody to preach and teach to you in a way that helps you understand the God that created you. So that you can then hear what he's saying to you and do it. So your life can be better. The reason, if we're honest, our life isn't where it should be because we do what we want to do. In our limited wisdom and understanding of all what we know already, the experiences we had in our lives makes us who we are and then gives us the results in our life that we have. New experiences, new ideas, new context, new, new application of things that the Bible will tell you or have you doing things different in wisdom that God will give you to do. But if you don't want it, you'll continue to repeat what you've always done. And get the same results. The definition of lunacy. Amen. So in Ephesians 4 and 13 through 14 says. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God. To a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And see, we've been talking about spiritual immaturity, but what's important is the reason why God wants us to be spiritually mature is that when people come and tell us something that is contrary to the word of God, We have to have an understanding based on the preaching and teaching we have received that will never allow anybody to undo and dismantle what we believe about God. If people are able to do that, you have to know that you are not getting the type of teaching that you need to sustain you and keep you stable. You don't have it. What Paul what Paul says is that we should put on the full armor of God and in the in the full armor of God, it involves the sword, which is the Bible. That we should have an understanding of the word of God that we may be able to wield it like a sword. But if we don't know it, we don't understand it, you don't have a sword, you got a pocket knife. And when you go out to try to use it on somebody that's got a bazooka or a machine gun, you're going to be in trouble. So God is trying to have you have preachers and teachers that will come and teach you in an expositional style that can prepare you and give you substance and give you a strong foundation, give you a a Christianity built on a rock instead of sand. Because the Bible tells us that any man that builds his house, that, that does not build his house on a rock, knows that that house will fall. If it's built on sand, the winds will blow and that house will fall. And so when people come to you with different ideas and philosophies, talking to you about the universe, speaking into your life and speaking stuff into existence and the universe will hear it. You, you, you buy into that because you don't have a foundational scriptural, scriptural understanding that will tell people that's some foolishness. Then they have you putting up vision boards talking about, oh, this is the secret. This is how you're going to get what you need. You have to have a focus on it. The Bible says meditate on the things of God daily. It doesn't say meditate on the things you want and the universe will hear it and give you what you want. The Bible doesn't say that. And so when people give you these ideas and try to present them in your life, don't just just shrug them off. Be like, that's foolishness. You're not going to have some friends. You're not going to have some people who don't want to be around you. You're going to have people calling you crazy. But also you're going to be living according to the standard of the word. And nobody can come and keep trying to take shots at it. Like a woodpecker just chopping that wood till you fall. 
keep presenting ideas that you say, well, today this ain't working. So now I'm going to depend on some of this foolishness I've heard. That's why God never wanted the children of God to be around other idols and other nations. Because if you sit around people long enough, their ideas will begin to saturate your ideas. So it's important that you have a strong foundation in God and in the word of God. So nothing can infiltrate your spirit and nothing can infiltrate your decision making and nothing can infiltrate your love for God. God is demanding that we get to a place where we are accepting and, 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 and desiring to hear a word that is broken down to us, that we can take it and use it for our life. That's what he wants you to have so you don't get fooled, you don't get duped, so you're not just floating in the wind every time something happens. You have a, a, a very good decision based on the word of God. He, he wants that for you so that you're not fooled. By all these things that's being said and everything that people are trying to throw out there and these ideas and these philosophies and you just don't pick them up and say, why not just add it to what I'm already doing? You can't mix what's going on in the world with God. The things of the world and God don't mix. So as we begin to close, the Bible asks us this question. In Romans 10 and 14 through 17, if you could turn your Bibles there in Romans 10, 14 and 17, the Bible asks us a very good question. It doesn't tell us this time, but it asks us. In Romans 10 and 14, 17, it says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing By the word of God. It is important that you hear the word, that you have somebody teach you the word, that they don't just throw it at you and hope you pick it up. But they teach it so you can understand it and that you understand it in a way that you can then apply it. And then when you can apply it, you can benefit from it. And then when you become better for it, we all can benefit from it. God didn't want his body to be weak. Because the people in the body were spiritually immature and refused to grow. Because if God is giving you the tools, if he's giving you pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and we still are not growing, that means it is a refusal. Because if somebody gives you tools and you don't use them, that's on you. That ain't on God. Don't keep blaming God for where you're stuck at if he's giving you all the things that you need to get unstuck. The world and everything in it has been created by the very word of God. And if what people need to understand that if the word of God gives us life, it must be the centerpiece of our worship. We can't come into church looking for stuff that doesn't fulfill us, that doesn't help us grow and doesn't benefit us. We have to stop making the music, the, the, the highlight. Stop making